Uh, good day, everyone. How are we all doing this afternoon? Good. Good. There's a couple of thumbs up. That's fantastic. Uh, so yeah, thanks, Kurt, for the introduction. Uh, my name's Lindsay Homewood. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, tips that we can use for learning when we have uh, incidents in our organizations and the review process that we sort of do after that. Um, so I'm going to start with a little story. When I was 16, uh, I was di uh, diagnosed with stage 2 Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, which is a cancer of the lymph nodes. Uh, so the treatment for that, uh, which at the time was considered very cutting edge, was a combination of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And as I'm not blessed with particularly good veins, uh, which is the way that they give you the chemotherapy, uh, I had a, a medical implant inserted into my chest called a vascular portacath. And so that's a small ceramic device, sort of about this size, um, so about an inch side to side. And it's just, just underneath the, uh, the skin and the chest. And so whenever they, uh, or whenever the, the nurses and the oncologists want to give me chemotherapy, they would sort of access the port instead of having to go into my veins. And it meant that they could pump the, uh, the chemotherapy into my body a hell of a lot quicker than if they were going through uh, intravenously. Uh, so I uh, received the treatment for that. Uh, I, was, uh, I, I was in remission, I guess. Um, and after about a year or so, uh, I decided to do a backpacking trip around uh, New Zealand. And at the tail end of that backpacking trip, uh, I got a thing called the norovirus. Quick show of hands. Who here has had the norovirus? I feel for all of you. It's not a lot of fun. Uh, and what's even uh, less fun is getting the norovirus when you have a compromised immune system. Uh, so I was hospitalized for that. Uh, they had a lot of difficulty uh, getting any sort of fluids into me uh, because they realized that they had this vascular portacath. Uh, they tried accessing that uh, to push some fluids through. They were unable to do that, and they ended up having to go back to my veins. Uh, and anyway, after a couple of days, uh, I, uh, I you know, mostly recovered, or at least enough to be able to get on a plane to fly back to Australia. And uh, the first night back in Australia, I woke up in the middle of the night and I experienced probably what is the most terrifying pain that I've ever felt in my entire life. Uh, I quite literally thought that I was having a heart attack and I was about to die. Uh, so I went to the, uh, I got my parents to take me to the local hospital um, and they very quickly worked out that I had two pulmonary embolisms in my body. Uh, and those pulmonary embolisms were uh, dislodged when in New Zealand they tried accessing the port to, uh, to push uh, fluids into me. And so pulmonary embolisms are basically blood clots, and uh, they, they're sitting on the lung. Uh, and so I have two of them, which is a lot of fun. So once they worked out that that was the case, uh, they went about very quickly removing that vascular portacath because who knew how many other uh, potential pulmonary embolisms were sitting there. Uh, so from working out that that was the case to the portacath being removed from my body was about uh, 45 minutes. So ready for socialized medicine. Um, and so a couple, of, uh, a couple of weeks later, I have my normal scans just to check on how things are going. Uh, and I get this very uh, hurried call from my oncologist a couple of days later after the scan results are coming. It's like, you, you need to come to the office. We need to have a conversation. I was like, OK, well, this is not going to go well, is it? So we went into the office, and he sort of sat me down, very stern, stern look on his face. And he said, look, we've got the results back uh, from your CT scan. Uh, the cancer isn't back, but it turns out that when we removed the vascular portacast from your body, we actually left a little bit of it inside. Uh, we left about two centimeters of tubing inside your body. Um, and it isn't just lodged anywhere. It's gone through your heart. Uh, so it's gone through two chambers of your heart. And it's now sitting between your, uh, your pulmonary. It's, it's in your pulmonary artery between your heart and your lungs. And so you know, there are a couple of options for how we deal with that. Uh, we could just not deal with that. We could leave that in there for the, uh, for the rest of your life. And you have to take blood thinners. Uh, we could do some open heart surgery where we crack open your chest and, uh, and try and cut the vein, pull it out really quickly, and sew it back up again. Uh, probably lose about 30% of lung capacity for the lung that will just die through that blood loss. Uh, and then the third option was an angiogram where they try and fish it out of my body, sort of like using a tiny lasso. Uh, but my doctor was, uh, my oncologist was very, uh, uh, very clear that the person that had performed the uh, the surgery on me uh, would no longer be practicing medicine, um, and that things were not going not going to go particularly well for him. Um, so, you know, in a certain sense, you could sort of say that justice was served here. Um, that was the end of that. So, fast forward to a couple of years ago, uh, I was uh, sort of the lead SRE uh, for uh, Movember. Quick show of hands, who here is familiar with Movember? OK, just a couple of people. So Movember is a, uh, it's a charity. They run a yearly event uh, where men grow moustaches. Um, and uh, they rate, based on you know, 
how, how long your moustache gets, you can convince other people to donate money to you, and that money goes to directly to funding uh, prostate cancer, and, or research into prostate cancer and male depression. Um, so I was running that, uh, it was the second year in, uh, things were not going well in that campaign. Things were going very, very badly in fact. Uh, basically been operating for about uh, five weeks with about four hours sleep every night, so exactly the position that you want to be in when you're an SRE. Uh, and we're getting to the tail end of the campaign where we know that we have a lot of donations coming in. That's the main money-making part of, of the year. So basically within a seven-week period, they take about 95% of their donations in, in a year. So pretty high stakes. And so as a way to sort of prevent any downtime during that, uh, during that peak donation period, uh, we uh, went about increasing the size of the database cluster, so it was a MySQL database. And we found that there was, as in the process of doing that, we were bringing a couple of additional database nodes online. Um, we uh, discovered that there was configuration management drift and it wasn't quite applying, so we were going through this whole troubleshooting process of uh, making a change, applying it, see if it's working. Uh, and then removing the database software and trying to run config management again to get it into an okay state, you know, well before the time of immutable infrastructure and that sort of thing. Uh, and anyway, in the process of doing this, I have another SRE that I'm pairing with and they're looking over my shoulder and they're, you know, checking every command that I'm running and I'm talking through what I'm thinking. And uh, I hit the wrong keys and I accidentally uninstalled the database software of MySQL from every single node in the cluster, taking the website down. Um, in the middle of that peak donation period. Now fortunately we had architected it in such a way that we were able to get back online very quickly. We didn't have to bring the entire cluster back online. We were able to bring just a part of it. So we were only down for about uh, 45 seconds. And those are probably 45 of the longest seconds of my life. Um, and at the end of that I was really bracing for some very severe punitive consequences because you know, very big customer. I was working at a managed hosting company, so you know, don't really want to lose that contract in the next year. Um, you know, it's a peak donation period, very, uh, very mission critical. Um, so, you know, totally reasonable that that I, that I would feel some sort of consequences for my actions. I'm sort of sitting there waiting for it, and there was nothing. That's sort of weird. What's what's different about that? Why why am I not getting punished for something that clearly has a very significant financial impact? Uh, and that really started me down this path of thinking about how were the situations that I had uh, earlier on with this vascular portacath removal mishap um, and the situation that I had, you know, taking down an entire uh, campaign site for, uh, you know, 45 seconds of the major peak donation period. Um, and what I really settled on was that the, it wasn't really about me or the surgeon, it was more about how our organizations more broadly uh, responded to failure and error within their midst. And so, really roughly speaking, when organizations experience some sort of failure, whether it's an accident or an incident, um, they tend to respond in one of two ways. Uh, they're responding through blame, sort of finding people that are responsible and holding them accountable, um, probably not treating them particularly well. Uh, but failure can also lead in learning organizations to inquiry, where we actually go about trying to learn more about you know, what made sense, why did these things happen. Uh, and so that sort of ties into this idea within safety science of safety one and safety two. Who here, quick show of hands, has read the, the Eric Holnagel paper about this? Safety one, safety two, cool, there's a link to it, one person, very good. There's a link to it at the end of the slide, you should absolutely go and have a read, it's a cracking read, only a couple of pages long. So in the old view of the way that human error works and the incidents and accidents unfold in our organizations, it's about constructing a narrative where we consider safety within our organizations to be the, absent of, uh, the absence of incidents and of accidents. Uh, and that failure that we get, that we occasionally stumble upon, is gonna come down to one of these three factors. It's gonna be a failure in technology, a failure in process, or a failure in people. Uh, an individual failure. Uh, and that sort of reinforces this whole idea that people are hazards that need to be contained and, uh, and dealt with within our organization. So if we can add enough sort of, you know, bubble wrap around these people, then, you know, then they're not going to get in the inner workings and sort of muck things up. Um, and that sort of goes to a much more fundamental idea that we have in a lot of societies around their sort of being bad apples in our midst, you know, people that come to work every day wanting to, you know, Make, make trouble for their co-workers. Uh, and this sort of line of inquiry is very much sort of reductionist, focusing on looking down and in at the actual problem and all the people that were there and the systems that were there, and sort of really keeping blinders on and not thinking about the bigger picture. 
Um, and by doing that, we tend to decompose our systems, and our systems are made of you know, technology, people, um, and process. And we try and decompose the systems and find the faulty component. Uh, and we try and you know, remove that or replace it or try and improve it, whatever we do. Right? So it's this very reductionist approach to dealing with problems within our organizations. And this flows into this other broader idea of bimodal operations, right? which is where uh, the world, uh, in systems that we're responsible for, have basically got two modes of operation that they're working in all the time. They're either working perfectly or they're not working at all. Now, people in this room, you will absolutely understand that that is a crazy idea because of the sort of scale of the systems that we are operating at. Uh, you know, they're always in a partially degraded uh, state, right? But they continue to work nonetheless, and continue, continue to perform quite well. So this safety one view of the way that the world works and the way that complex systems work uh, is this very binary notion of like complete failure or complete success, and there is nothing in between. So then we have the new view of failure uh, and the and way that safety actually works within our organizations, which is much more focused on looking up and out, not down and in, but up and out at the overall context and the environment around people when they're actually operating in these systems. And that's about understanding the connections, not just the components, but the connections between them and how they actually function within our organizations. Uh, because the... Uh, uh, the thing about learning about what goes wrong, it's, you know, if we focus just on the components, we, we are understanding the problem in isolation, right? It's the connections that really keep things working the majority of the time. Uh, and so that means that, we, you know, we always, within our organizations, have success under varying conditions, right? There's some stuff that's working really well most of the time. There are other parts of our systems that are, that are you know, partially degraded. Uh, and the, these conditions, they do change over time, right? You know, time is, you know, time is linear, it moves forward, things change. Uh, and so the operation of those systems is going to have to adapt based on uh, the changing in those conditions, right? And then with this view then, people then become a resource for system flexibility and the resilience, right? It's the, it's the people that are actually shepherding the system and sort of influencing it, not controlling it directly, but influencing parts of it to achieve that, uh, that flexible and uh, resilient outcome. Um, and that fundamentally means that we just have to embrace complexity, right? You probably heard, uh, you know, we, we quite frequently describe our systems as complex systems. Um, cute little fact, uh, sometimes we talk about things, problems being complicated, and we're like, what's the difference between uh, a problem being complicated and a problem being complex. Well, the answer to that is actually comes into the Latin root of the word. So Latin root of the, uh, the word uh, complicated uh, means to fold, right? So folding paper. Whereas the Latin root of the word uh, complex actually means to weave, right? So things are actually more integrated with one another. And if you pull one thread, it has these cascading effects on all the other threads that are there as well. Uh, and this then ties into this broader idea of just culture uh, within our organizations, which is you know, pretty huge in uh, aviation, uh, safety science, uh, construction, mining, those sort of industries, uh, where they've realized that safety, the safety one approach to dealing with problems and accidents and incidents only gets them so far. You, know, you, can, you can only fix so many problems uh, by adding more barriers to them or you know, increasing the number of steps that people have got to go through. Like There is an inflection point where suddenly that doesn't really work so well. Uh, and to do that, for a just culture to work, it means that we have to embrace these different perspectives, different stories, and different interests. And some of these are competing with one another within our organizations as well. Um, Sidney Decker, who's the main sort of proponent of this idea of just culture, uh, says that we need many partially overlapping and always somehow contradictory descriptive layers to approximate a rendition of reality, right? So it's a much more holistic cognitive model for understanding how our uh, how the systems that we work with on a day-to-day -day are dealing, uh, or, or actually working, right? So that means that you can have two statements that are directly contradictory to one another and both can actually be true at the same time, um, versus say, a more analytical cognitive model uh, where those two contradictory statements, only one thing could be, uh, well, only one of those can actually be correct. Uh, and so through just culture, we are actually creating an opportunity for learning within our organizations, right? Um, and so there are a whole bunch of really great advantages for learning organizations, which you're probably quite familiar with. 
Um, but from a safety science perspective, the, the reason that we want learning organizations is that we tend to get higher quality feedback from the people that are doing the work at the front lines, right? So you've got high quality feedback going from the people that are doing that work all the way up to the management, uh, well, all the way up the management chain to the people that are sort of setting the overall strategic direction. Um, it's not, uh, you know, it, it's, it's relatively uh, lossless information. There's not a lot of noise in it. Uh, but that high quality feedback then uh, puts management in a position where they can make more informed choices that are sort of helping those overall strategic objectives. And so the cycle completes, right? Uh, and that is really important because if we remove uh, blame and punitive action from our environments, it means that the people that are actually doing the hard work at the pointy end of the spear are able to focus on quality and delivery, right? They're not worried about uh, you know, covering their asses. Uh, they're not worried about you know, trying to throw other people under the bus. They're just focused on actually delivering a quality outcome and, you know, and actually doing that effectively as well and efficiently. Uh, and that's really important because you know, we, we shed this enormous load that we carry of having to try and you know, defend our decisions um, after, you know, after good things, both good things and bad things have happened. Uh, so I posit that there are three main factors that contribute to uh, inhibited learning in, uh, in organizations. Uh, the first is blame, the second is language, the third is sharing. So we're gonna start with a little bit of language first. And when I'm talking about language, I'm talking about uh, hacks that we can use to minimize blame after something bad has happened and we want to try and learn from that. Uh, so this is very simple hierarchy, which is what is greater than how is greater than why, which is greater than who. Uh, and these are these framing devices that we're using when we're actually trying to recall events that have happened in the past and trying to understand them uh, in the present so that we can make better choices in the future. And these are words that we're using in a variety of contexts, right? It can be uh, talking with other people, listening, with, listening uh, can be reading and writing in you know, a wide variety of media. Uh, so, you know, it'll happen in conversations, retros, learning reviews, postmortems, whatever the sort of activities are that your organizations are engaging in. Um, so let's start with the why. Um, why can be quite problematic as a, as a framing device because it's often used and deployed as a way to question intentions and justify uh, asking people, forcing people to justify their actions after a particular thing has happened. So, you know, you probably run into phrases similar to this in your working career, like, why didn't you follow the rum books? Or, why didn't you escalate sooner? Right? And when we use why like this, it's a way to attribute and apportion blame. Now, I want to be really clear, why isn't inherently a bad word to use, uh, particularly when we're applying it to understanding how systems work. So why did this particular system fail? And the slide's going to come back. We're going to find out. Great. Um, but the problem with using why is that it can be, it sort of puts us on a bit of a knife edge, right? Once we're using that word frequently, it's, it becomes pretty easy to start applying, we're using why as a framing device when we're talking about people's actions and behavior during an incident. Um, so you're trading on a very fine line here. Uh, and that means that we end up focusing that inquiry on people, which is not the thing that's going to help our organizations as a whole actually learn and improve. Uh, the other problem with why is that it is often deployed as a counterfactual. So by counterfactual, we're talking about a reality that simply doesn't exist, right? So examples of that are like, why didn't you follow the run books? Like you're asking, uh, you're asking somebody to justify why they didn't do something at the time, right? It's a, simply a reality that didn't exist. Um, and you know, why didn't you escalate sooner? And the problem with this is that uh, people tend to have a very good nose for that. Like if you've experienced that and been on the uh, receiving end of a bad experience like that, uh, you typically have a reaction a little bit like this whenever you come across it. Uh, the other problem with why as well is that it also feeds into this other cognitive bias called the, uh, uh, what this cognitive bias called the fundamental attribution error, uh, which is that we uh, say that people's actions are explained by their personality and their innate character, um, not the context that they are operating in. And, and we, we stumble into this all the time, particularly when we're sort of analyzing how other people have behaved around us. Uh, so the next word, the next framing device that we're going to look at here is how. Um, and how is really fantastic for articulating mechanics, specifically in technology, in a technology context. 
Um, so how did the site go down? Um, how did the team react? Right, so it's sort of using a little bit more foresight and not trying to you know, get people to justify things that they've done in the past. And this is great because uh, it ends up distancing people from their actions, right? It's, talking, it's, it's focusing more on what actually did happen. We're not talking about a counterfactual uh, situation. We're talking about what actually happened, like the actual mechanics of it. Uh, and it's really, really fantastic for uh, clarifying technical detail as well. Uh, so how is a really great uh, word to uh, word to use when trying to frame inquiry on a technical uh, on a technical line? Um, the one problem with how though is that can often limit the scope of the inquiry. We become so focused on understanding the how that we don't. Uh, off, well, we, we often can fall into a trap of not thinking about the broader environment and the broader context, right? So we're so focused trying to get over the fence that we don't realize that there's a hole in the fence right next to it. Uh, so what is the last framing device? And this is like, this should be the go-to framing device that you use when you're talking about uh, incidents and accidents. Um, so what is really helpful because it helps us uncover reasoning, the reasoning of the people that were in the situation at the time. So what did you think was happening? Uh, what did you do next? What made the most sense to you? Um, what was going through your mind at that particular point in time, right? And this is a vital, vital tool to be able to use to build empathy with actors in your complex systems. And what does that actually mean? Well, it's about building empathy with people, right? Understanding what was going through people's heads at the time. Um, and the other really interesting thing about what as well is that it's very easy to deploy as a tool that we can use to explain what was happening in terms of foresight. So not asking people to justify post haste, it's about asking, okay, what happened next? What were you thinking? What made sense about this particular course of action? Um, and this ties into this idea in psychology called local rationality, uh, which, quick show hands, who here has heard of this concept? Okay, a couple of people. So local, rational, local, uh, local rationality is really simple. Um, it's this concept that people make what they consider to be the best decision given the information available to them at the time, right? So nobody, makes, nobody intentionally makes a bad decision. People are making trade-offs based on quite often very limited information that they have at hand. Uh, and you can see this in like, things like the retrospective prime directive. Um, so, you know, I'm sure most people have engaged in a retro at least one point in their career, hopefully doing a little bit more frequently than that. Um, but, you know, it says that regardless of what we discover, what we discover, uh, we understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job that they could given the, what they knew at the time and the situation at hand, right? So we can see how what is a really useful way of sort of framing that in terms of, you know, what we actually did know, not, not in terms of, like, why didn't we act on information that we didn't know at the time. Uh, and this is really useful for explaining in terms of foresight. So the way to sort of think about uh, people that are operating inside an incident is that it's sort of like you're in a dark tunnel, right? And you have this like tiny flashlight. Maybe it's a little bit of a bigger light, but you're trying to move through the tunnel, right? And you can see that, you know, maybe there's somebody up ahead, I'm not quite sure, um, but you've got no choice other than to move forward at that particular point in time. You just have to keep going, you know, even though you're, you're walking into darkness more often than not. And eventually, you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, it might be you know, getting a job someplace else, but you know, eventually there is a light at the end of that tunnel. Um, and contrast that to hindsight, which is sort of taking this you know, 60, 70, 100,000 foot view um, after the fact, where we've learnt more about what the actual outcome was and what were the contributing factors or you know, root causes, if we want to use that word to it. Um, and hindsight, you know, it, it sort of taints our perspective of what's actually happened because uh, we're looking at something that is, you know, that is quite far away and it's, that we're moving further and further away from with every passing second. Um, so hindsight uh, really taints the way that we talk and think about problems uh, and accidents that happen within our organisation. And the most important thing that we need to be focusing on uh, when we are uh, using what uh, is trying to understand what did the inside of the tunnel look like to the people that were there. How well lit was it? Um, was the tunnel on fire? Um, you know, that, that sort of thing, right? Um, so the next step is blame. And this is where language really hits sort of our more neurological processes and things that really fundamentally change the way that we think and act both during incidents but also in the way that we talk about them uh, after the fact. And quite often, you know, we, we see things like this deployed uh, with, you know, possibly within our own organization, sometimes within other organizations of, you know, you are responsible for this failure. Uh, you should have stopped this from happening. Uh, you were neglectful, inattentive, and derelict of duty. Uh, and this really comes down to a, like a really deeply rooted uh, idea within a lot of cultures that there are bad apples amongst us. So, you know, people that wake up in the morning and go, wow, how can I mess up my co-worker's day today? Like, just to quick show of hands, who 
every day wakes up, or not even occasionally goes, yeah, and, and they wake up and they think, wow, how can I screw somebody else over that I work with? All right, nobody. How many of you think that you have coworkers that think the same thing? Yeah, one hand, okay. You're all, you're all secretly thinking it, I know it. Um, and again, this ties into this idea of people as hazards that need to be mitigated and, and contained within our organizations. And the problem with this way of thinking about the world is that it ignores a very fundamental truth, which is that sometimes really bad things, like just terrible things happen, and actually there is no one person or even one group of people that is to blame for that. And then that dovetails with the other side, which is that things far more often go right within our organization than they actually go wrong. <coughs> it just keeps going. This is us. This is our world. Every day, things are going far more right than they are going wrong. Not a single accident. I could watch this for hours, but we're going to keep going. Um, <laughs> So uh, this really ties into that system two way, or the safety two way of thinking about things as people being that resource for system flexibility and resilience. So you know, when one of the cars has an accident, people move around that right, so that it doesn't affect the overall flow of how work gets done. Um, so when we're talking about finger pointing, we're really talking about cognitive biases here. And cognitive biases are like two of the, well, there are two specific cognitive biases today that we're going to talk about that really impact the way that we uh, deal with information after the fact. Uh, so you're probably thinking, like, what is this cognitive bias? Maybe you've heard of this before. Um, cognitive biases are really simple. They're essentially just mental shortcuts that we engage in. We actually have very little control over. Um, so when we are processing information as we are interacting with the world, our brains are constantly optimizing for timeliness over accuracy, right? So the way that that actually works is that, let's say that you are uh, on the savanna somewhere and you see a shape moving in the grass and you think that it's a lion, right? So for the people who, uh, who their you know, visual identification capabilities um, are not particularly good at that and are less risk averse and they have a higher chance of being eaten by the lion and thus, you know, not being here. Um, so evolutionarily, as a species, uh, we're very good at identifying and mitigating possible risks uh, ahead of time. And part of the way that we do that uh, is by, uh, well, our, we're actually wired so that we optimize for this timeliness over the, or timeliness of processing of information over the overall accuracy of that. Uh, it's a pretty, good still, a pretty good skill to have. It's the reason that we're here today as a species. Uh, and so when we say that we are problem solving, our brains are applying a heuristic. And we say that if that heuristic, uh, which is a much more underlying sort of cognitive process, produces a correct result, we would say that this is a rational choice. But if the heuristic produces an incorrect result, we say that this is a cognitive bias. And there are literally hundreds of, uh, of cognitive biases. Uh, the real research into this kicked off uh, back in the early 70s, so Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky uh, with two of the, uh, the researchers that were really uh, you know, at the forefront of, of sort of uncovering a lot of these cognitive biases. Um, there are new cognitive biases that are being discovered and you know, in a, you know, a peer-reviewed context, like plenty of evidence around it um, on literally a yearly basis. Uh, it's a really interesting field of, science, uh, of psychology to pay attention to. Uh, and you're probably thinking, okay, what's this heuristic? Well, let's just keep it really simple for the, for the purpose of this talk. It's just pattern matching that our brain is doing when we're dealing with this information that's coming in. Okay, so let's think about what some of those cognitive biases are that contribute to a blameful culture. So what I want you to do is I want you to tell me how many times the team in white passes the ball to one another. Okay, quick shout out. How many times did you see the ball be passed? 13. 13. Any other numbers? 14, 15, okay, a couple of numbers there. Uh, quick show of hands for the people who haven't done this exercise before. Uh, who saw the moonwalking bear? One person. All right, let's go back and take another look at that. 
so this is an example of a thing called the confirmation bias, uh, which is that we actively seek out information that reinforces existing views. So if we're looking for something, uh, we're going to find the information that backs that up. Uh, we're going to ignore alternative explanations. So we're going to discard information that doesn't fit the model that we're trying to cram data into. Uh, and then thirdly, we tend to interpret ambiguous information in favor of existing assumptions, which is sort of wild when you think about it. Like, yeah, there's data that's you know, possibly incomplete, and you're not quite sure if it sort of backs up your model, but you're going to stuff it in there anyway. Um, and again, this totally ties into this idea of people of hazards, right? If you think that people are hazards, you're going to find evidence to suggest that people are hazards, right? It's just really that simple. Um, so probably like the most hilarious example of this is this dude. So uh, who here is, quick show of hands, who's familiar with this dude here? Okay, a couple of people. So for the people in the room who aren't familiar with him, um, his name is Stephen Colbert. Uh, he, uh, for uh, nearly a decade, uh, ran a show on a, the Comedy Network in the United States. Um, and he basically ran this comedy show that was sending up uh, sort of the, the conservative political establishment in the United States. So he basically like took uh, you know, pretty, pretty wild arguments on the conservative uh, side of politics and sort of pushed them even further um, just as a way to sort of send that up and ridicule um, this, you know, the, the, the sort of talking points that were being trotted out. Uh, it's pretty amusing to watch. Uh, but fun fact about this, uh, it turns out that there is quite a large number of conservative viewers of the show, just wasn't people who were identifying as liberal, but they were actually, he had a quite a sizable conservative following. And the thing that is just totally nuts about it is that they actually thought that he was genuine. They genuinely thought that he was a conservative political pundit. Um, so this is a really great paper from April 2009 about it. Uh, you can go, I've got a link to it after the fa uh, at the end of the talk, you can go have a look at it there. Uh, but there's sort of three different uh, models that they looked at. So they did uh, regression modeling predicting the perception that Colbert is genuine, the perception of Colbert is politically conservative, and the perception of Colbert as a Republican. Um, and so uh, the TLDR on this is that the set of results supports the idea that conservatives not only process the messages as if they were targeting liberals, so he's having a go at liberals, uh, but they also assess the source, so Stephen Colbert himself, to be conservative, Republican, and disliking liberals. Right? It's not like they were watching a different show. They were literally watching the same show every single day for years. And yet, because of the biases they brought to the table when they were processing that information, they choose to, uh, or the viewers, conservative viewers, chose to discard that information that would possibly suggest that actually maybe he was having a bit of a go at them and sending them up. Right? Pretty incredible when you think about it. Uh, and so confirmation bias like rules everything around me, right? Like pretty much everywhere you go, you tend to find yourself slipping into confirmation bias. Um, and you know, there's there's some things that we can do to forget uh, to, to sort of work around that. But like during an incident, you've probably been in a situation where it's like, okay, uh, I'm getting like uh, I'm getting this error and it's telling me that it's in my code up here. But clearly the code that I've written is perfect and there's no problems. It's not a problem with my code, it's a problem in a library. So then you go and look in a library. Oh, it's not a problem in this library, it's a problem in this other library. 10 minutes pass. Oh, it's not this other library, go to this other one. And then eventually it's like, oh, okay, actually the problem was in my code the, the whole way along. Quick show of hands, who has had that happen to them? Yeah, the rest of you are lying, you've all had it. Um, and so, you know, this is really problematic during an incident, right? Because if we have a particular idea about what is causing the incident, we tend to ignore the information that suggests otherwise, right? Deeply problematic when we're trying to actually get to the bottom of, of the site outage or whatever the reliability problem is, right? And then post-incident, it comes to bear as well, right? So if we're looking for human failure and we're looking to treat humans as hazards, we are going to find evidence to back that up. There's just no two ways about it. We're very, very good at being able to find that sort of information and synthesize it into a coherent argument to you know, prove our existing held positions. So the good news is that there are actually a few things that we can do here to counter that cognitive bias. Uh, the first is that we can take opposing viewpoints uh, so uh, by that I'm sort of talking about appointing like a devil's advocate within the, within the group, right? So when it comes down to like making key decisions, you have somebody that is uh, on purpose arguing for a counter position, right? That they may not uh, actually believe in. And so lots of really interesting research into this over the last sort of two decades. Uh, a pretty interesting study from uh, the mid-2000s about uh, stock exchange traders who would make sort of broader strategic decisions. Uh, so they found that, uh, oh, sorry, investment decisions. So they found that uh, the traders that appointed somebody to be a devil's advocate 
uh, and argued for that counterpoint uh, were actually, they, they produce more profit over time, right? And the, uh, the explanation for that uh, was that by being faced with a counter argument, a different point of view, um, or another hypothesis, the team was then forced to engage in you know, more rigorously with those arguments, which meant that they were more likely to find flaws and weaknesses in their own positions in the first place. Now, fast forward to the last couple of years, there's some other interesting research that's emerged that shows that um, this effect actually doesn't work if people in the team know that one of their co-workers is actively playing the devil's advocate here. So for this to work effectively, you have to have somebody uh, anonymously be elected the devil's advocate, uh, and you know they have to be pretty good at role playing that as well. And the teams that do know that somebody in their midst is actually actively playing the devil's advocate, um, they tend not to engage as forcefully and as rigorously in the argument because they're like, oh, this person is just you know it's just making the argument because they're the devil's advocate, not because uh, not because they actually genuinely believe in that uh, and believe in that situation. Uh, the other interesting thing about confirmation bias is that uh, if your conclusion is negative, quite often it means that it's biased. So this is related to another cognitive bias called the negativity bias. Uh, but a uh, quick shorthand is that if you find that out of a particular learning review or you know, post-incident review process that you go through, you find a whole bunch of conclusions that are negative, uh, it's very possible that you've gotten to that point because you've been tainted a little bit by confirmation bias. So it's something to keep in the back of your mind. All right, so the other major cognitive bias that is sort of really the killer when it comes to talking about failure and bad things that have happened in our organization is this thing called the hindsight bias. Uh, so quick show of hands, who here is familiar with this one? Okay, just a couple of people, fantastic. Uh, so hindsight bias is sort of more uh, uh, colloquially known as the knew it all along effect, um, like a fancy, uh, scientific name of creeping determinism from back in the 70s is the other, the other sort of field of study into this. Um, but when we recall an outcome, recall facts leading up to that outcome, um, we consider it to be more predictable if we actually know what the outcome is. Um, even though there is quite often little to no objective basis for being able to predict that outcome in the first place, right? So more knowledge that we acquire further down the line actually influences the way that we perceive our ability to be able to predict the bad thing from happening in the first place. Um, so this is actually a type of memory distortion that we all engage in. And this is, this is sort of crazy because this is actually like wired into the way that memory works. So the way that memory sort of works is that uh, think of it as like a, every memory sort of exists in a, a standalone USB key, right? And every time you want to recall the memory, you've got to take the USB key out of a drawer and you've got to plug it in. And in the process of uh, reading the data off the, off the USB key for that particular memory, uh, you're also writing back data at the same time. Right? And when you're writing the data back, uh, it's actually taking your more recent knowledge acquisition into account and it's actually infusing that with the previous memory that you've had. Right. So that's why over time, memories actually fade because as we, uh, it's sort of like a lossy compression, right? So as we recall a memory more frequently, uh, then we, uh, uh, we actually degrade the memory over time. This has got really interesting implications for uh, people that suffer post-traumatic stress disorder. That's part of the reason why people get flashbacks because it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a difficult experience that they don't know how to contextualize. And so by recalling it and recalling it, it gives their brain an opportunity to try and more better understand what actually made sense about it until eventually the memory fades, hopefully. Um, so you know, the hindsight bias here is just a, a, a much uh, less terrible version of that, but you know it's it's got pretty far-reaching consequences. So we know that this new information that we receive after the fact influences how we actually remember the event, which is pretty wild when you think about it. Uh, and, and more often than not, the distortion that, that that we undertake actually tends to favour the actor. So it favours ourselves within that situation. Uh, and, and in really severe cases, or maybe not even that severe, but you know, for people who uh, don't know how to check their uh, hindsight bias in at the door, which is you know actually sort of impossible, but people that don't actively try to minimise the hindsight bias um, tend to uh, tend to have that distortion be used to form a judgment where we're saying that you know you are responsible for this failure because you were neglectful, inattentive, you know, and derelict of duty. And we tend to, uh, hindsight bias leads us down a path of attributing failure to a person that is not us, so it's an othering effect, uh, not a system as a whole, right? And this, again, ties into this idea of bimodal operation. So after, the after a, 
uh, particular incident, we can draw a line and say, you know, there are people that were uh, actively working to create the incident, and there are people that were actively working to prevent the incident. Which side are you on, right? Which, again, we all know is like, intellectually, that's just bonkers, but that's, that's unfortunately the way that the hindsight bias works. Um, and even worse, the more negative a particular outcome that we are recalling, the stronger the bias actually kicks in, the harder that we have to work at minimizing and mitigating that. Um, and we see that, like this is a really, really common thread. It's not just like, it's not just sort of restricted to safety science. It's like, it's a common narrative thread in the way that we talk about big international events. So these are, you know, these are newspaper headlines that were appearing within literally hours of the MA17 disaster. You know, it's, it, the tragedy reveals this need for a flight path overhaul. Uh, the, the flight path is questioned. Uh, you know, they could have avoided the Ukrainian airspace for $66 per passenger. Um, you know, why, there's that word again, why was MH17's flight path over a conflict zone, right? And you know, these are not fringe opinions. Like these are literal newspaper headlines from uh, publications that we, that we know and that we trust and we expect them to you know, give us a reasonable idea about how the way the world works. Although possibly not the Daily Mail. Uh, and then more interestingly, in the last year or so, there's been some uh, research that, uh, that's popped up around how uh, cultural uh, interpretations of global information are perceived across cultures. Uh, so this is a really fascinating study. Um, I'll just give you the, the really simple sort of summarized version of it. Um, their findings suggest that reading a biased Wikipedia article strengthens people's conviction that the event was likely and foreseeable. So the way to think about that is that hindsight bias is contagious. If we get exposed to other people engaging in hindsight bias, we are then more likely to engage in hindsight bias ourselves, right? But interestingly, through the, through the, the several experiments that they ran, they actually found that that effect was limited to participants from a Western culture. In Eastern cultures, they don't seem to be as uh, affected by it. And they tried to break that down into uh, different cognitive models for the way that we process information. Um, and the whole idea was that sort of, you know, people that are, that are coming from an Eastern background are probably more engaged in holistic thinking because they're probably more influenced by sort of Confucian ideas uh, about the way that the world works. And so uh, their hypothesis was that the people that engage in more holistic thinking, a holistic cognitive model, are uh, less likely to, uh, to be tainted by the hindsight bias. Uh, it turns out that that was wrong. Uh, it turns out that uh, people from uh, both uh, Eastern and Western cultures uh, equally engaged in, uh, in holistic versus analytical thinking styles. So in an, analytic, in an analytical thinking style, like we talked about before, um, uh, we, can't, you know, we can't hold two contradictory pieces of information in our brain and think that they are both correct at the same time, as opposed to a holistic model where we absolutely can. Uh, but yeah, they found that uh, the... Uh, the culture that somebody is from doesn't actually dictate what thinking, cognitive thinking style that they actually have, which is sort of fascinating. That contradicts about 20 years worth of research. Um, but more interestingly, they actually found that uh, when you had people, regardless of the cultural background, that were uh, reading the information and in English, they were more likely to engage in hindsight bias. That's sort of terrifying for people that only speak English. Um, so my recommendation is that if you speak a language other than English, um, you should absolutely try and engage, uh, try and do your post-incident reviews and any of these sort of conversations in that language that is not English, because the evidence is starting to suggest that, you know, people who do it in English are more likely to engage in the hindsight bias, which is sort of, again, wild when you think about it. This is a brand new paper. It's only been around for a year, so there's a whole bunch more studies that are going to come out of this, but yeah, definitely something to watch. It's pretty fascinating. Uh, so hindsight bias is the culture killer within your organization uh, because it really taints all interactions, right? You have one little bit of pollution that gets put into the stream uh, and that's just going to kill the fish, right? And, you know, it's, it's going to affect all those interactions and those connections that you have with other people. Once the scene is sown, uh, it's very, very difficult to clean up from that mess. Uh, so there are some things, fortunately, that we can do to counter this bias, uh, but we should be really clear, it's not actually possible to eliminate the hindsight bias completely. We can mitigate the effects of it and we can minimize it, but we can't actually remove it entirely. Uh, so the number one thing that we can do there is that we try and explain bad situations in terms of foresight. So have a timeline, start at the beginning, work your way forward, right? Uh, 
Uh, and that's really about engaging in a process of sense making. So it's not about assigning a value judgment to particular actions, it's about what makes sense at this particular point in time to these people, you know, for them to, to work in this particular way and make those decisions. What made sense to the people that were in the tunnel. Uh, also seeking alternative hypotheses um, is a really great way as well of, minim uh, of minimizing the, the hindsight bias. Uh, to harness this bias, another really interesting fact here, so if you probably have done an exercise like this like before you're about to do a big product launch or a feature launch, get everybody together in like a sort of a pre-war room, like a pre-accident investigation and you say, okay, we're about to launch, what do you think the things are that are going to break? You get everybody to brainstorm for sort of 10-15 minutes, okay, these are the things that we can work on next. Uh, and then you disband and you get everybody to come back a couple of minutes later and say, okay, transport yourself to the future that hasn't happened yet. Imagine that we are now 5, 10, 15 minutes post-launch. What are the things that have broken? Now, the interesting thing about that is that that actually requires us to think about a, a, a past that has simply not happened right. But you tend to find that the answers that you get when you engage in an exercise like this are radically different from when you talk about it in terms of like what are the things that you think will, will break. So you can actually sort of harness and trigger the hindsight bias, or trigger and harness, um, to, uh, to come up with these alternative ideas about how things are actually going to break in the future. All right, the last piece here that we're going to talk about today is sharing. And that's really about embracing these different perspectives, stories, and interests uh, during the conversations, investigations, you know, whatever the sort of activity is that you're engaging in as an organization. So the most important thing here for leaders, people that are running these teams, uh, that, are, you know, that are doing these post-incident uh, post reviews, is it's a, really about setting the scene. So having those solid foundations to be able to do the rest of the exercise. If you don't have that right, you shouldn't even bother. Uh, and that means that as leaders of SREs, we have a responsibility to the people that, uh, that we work with to create these psychologically safe environments where uh, there is going to be uh, actions, when people divulge information that possibly puts them in a bad light, they are going to be treated fairly uh, and non-punitively. The moment that you have any sort of punitive action based on information that is disclosed within one of these learning reviews, um, people will shut down. You know, people will just not want to engage in it anymore because they saw that, hey, one of, the, one of my colleagues volunteered a bit of information that you know, made them look sort of bad and they got really punished for it. So what is the incentive? for divulging information that maybe puts me in a bad light. So you get complete disengagement at that point. And that's really about building that, that fundamental layer of trust amongst everybody there, uh, which again, the retrospective prime directive, it's a really great starting point. You know, regardless of what we discover, um, you know, we did the best job we did, or that we could, based on the information in hand, right? Again, ties into this idea of local rationality. We make what we consider to be the best decisions given the information available to us at the time. A structured canvas is a really great way of taking sort of all the crazy things that happen during an incident and getting it into a more manageable form, right? So you don't want to put too much structure about it because then you often get homogeny in the narratives that come out of it. But you want some sort of structure so that you can sort of take all the weird and wonderful things that we learn and get it into a format that we can possibly reuse later. Um, so, you know, something a little bit like this, like Trello is a really great collaboration tool for this. Because uh, it's you know, really fantastic if you're working in a distributed team. Um, so you're going to start with a column about the timeline and the facts where we're listing out the events that happened contributing to that incident. Um, questions out of that, what puzzles us, consequences, the, you know, the actual possibly commercial impact of that incident, contributing factors, uh, what went well, what we do differently. So you know, it's sort of those four key retrospective questions. And then we have a list of proposed actions which anybody can throw something into uh, as for how we can possibly mitigate and improve in the future. Uh, and then we have the list of final actions. Um, and so the starting point for all this is to get stuff into the timeline. So to explain in terms of foresight, pick a point back before the incident, and then start dictating, well, start taking notes one, one Trello card at a time um, for all the events as they actually unfolded. Don't jump ahead. If people jump ahead, it's your responsibility as a facilitator to get people to come back to the present and try and move forward. Um, and so we have to start at the beginning for that to work. And again, we're trying to explain in terms of foresight, not in terms of hindsight, right? And you know, you, you tend to find that uh, you know you get a whole bunch of different cards here, but it's a really great way, a really useful tool actually, uh, for being able to create reports uh, down the line because you have like a you know pretty a high fidelity version of you know all the events that actually took place. Uh, so when it actually comes to constructing a report at the end of this. Uh, it's really important to know the audience of that report, like who's actually going to be consuming it. So if you, is your audience a technical or a non-technical audience? Uh, what sort of stakeholders are they? 
Um, and so that sort of leads to this other way that you can approach that, which is that maybe one report isn't the way to do it. One you sort of one true report to rule them all and in the darkness bind them. Um, you know, having multiple reports for multiple audiences, right? Uh, and a really useful way of doing that is that, you know, it's really interesting to look at the sort of things that come up in proposed actions versus the final actions. That can also, you know, it's got some interesting signal in there um, as to the sort of things that you want to communicate to various stakeholders. You know, you can apply labels to the cards and things like that. You quite often find that the, uh, the actions that come out of one of these post-incident reviews uh, will mean different things to different people, right? And so non-technical, people from a non-technical background who are perhaps non-technical stakeholders, you know, talking about technical details isn't going to be particularly helpful to them, right? So you include the actions in that report that are actually going to make sense to them and you can provide a link through to the technical report if you want, but, you know, you can have the same message but it appears in multiple, multiple ways, right? Um, also be aware of uh, weasel words and cliches. So things like, you know, the team should have, it's a counterfactual, mistakes are made, another counterfactual, we apologize for any inconvenience caused, it's a favorite, a lot of people like using this, it's a distancing technique. Um, the root cause of the outage was, again, it's like a reductionist safety one approach. Uh, human error led to, okay, systems of thinking, or systems one thinking, so this is humans as hazards, right? Uh, so a way to sort of flip that on its head is something like this. So in the future, the team will. So you know, this is what we've learned, and this is the things that we're going to do differently in the future. Um, locally, rational decisions were made. Um, you know, maybe including an appendix to explain what local rationality is. That can sometimes help. Um, we are really sorry for. So actually, taking real ownership of those incidents. Uh, there are a variety of contributing factors. That's more up and out way of looking at problems. Uh, and the system didn't have enough adaptive capacity to. So that's that system two thinking, right? And you have these weasel words in a in a in a file that we can sort of run over any of the reports that we run. And again, it's about creating those psychological, uh, psychologically safe environments once we have created the report and published it, um, so that inevitably there will be backlash when you engage in a in a, in a, a learning review or a post-incident review uh, session like this, uh, where you know it's not not the nice type of splashback either. Um, so as leaders of SREs, we owe it to our people to be the poop umbrella that we want to see in the world. All right, so you're probably uh, thinking about that story that I started with, um, and what on earth has got to do with this whole talk. Uh, so we ended up going for option three, uh, which was uh, the angiogram, where they basically insert this giant needle into my femoral artery. They run this little wire, guide wire all the way up. It goes through two different chambers of my heart. Um, they deployed this lasso, and oh yeah, by the way, I was awake for all of this as well. Like, it's not something that happened. They, they don't knock you out for this. And so you're sort of seeing a real-time version of this. It's like a sort of a real-time x-ray, and like everybody in the room except for me is like covered in lead, lead shield and clothing, so it's going to be great for my thyroid in about 30 years. Um, but anyway, they, you know, they, run the, uh, they run the guide wire through the two chambers of the heart. Uh, they deploy the lasso. They manage to lasso the, the, the tubing. They pull it all the way out. It actually gets stuck in one of the chambers of, of my heart, um, which is a really weird feeling. Uh, they end up having to let it go, and it, it sort of resettles, and they do the whole thing again, and they manage to pull it all the way out. Um, and fun fact, it turns out that the CT scan that I had uh, was a little bit inaccurate, and it wasn't a two centimeter piece of tubing that they thought. It was a 12 centimeter piece of tubing. Pretty wild. And so you're probably thinking, well, you know, that's a great story, but that was life and death. How on earth does that relate to, uh, you know, to this other story that you were telling, us, telling me about uh, with Movember and the, the downtime that we had there? Um, <clears throat> well, there are really two factors that are at play here. Um, the first is that the punishment that was meted out to that surgeon uh, happened uh, way before they actually know, knew the true length uh, of that particular failure. Um, so, you know, the, the fact that it was 12 centimeters and not 2 centimeters. Uh, the second thing was that we knew in very real financial terms how much it actually cost for every second of downtime. And so from that, we can extrapolate to how much, you know, how much money we lost out of for donations, which then follows through to well, what were the research programs that we were unable to fund? Which means, did we, you know, with some of those programs actually, you know, a little bit more risky, so we weren't funding them because we didn't have the money available to us, but they actually could have, you know, resulted in a cure for prostate cancer. And that's why it's so important to think much more up and out and think about the connections, not the components, right? Why we have to start at the beginning, why we have to think in terms of foresight and not hindsight, 
and we, why we use these sort of framing devices, the what and how, not the why and who. Uh, and by thinking of people as resources and for system flexibility and the, and the resilience overall, because we know within our organizations that things go right uh, far more often than they actually go wrong. And we owe it to the people that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis to understand what made sense to them at that time, what made that course of action that they engaged in the right one. I'm Lindsay. Thank you very much.